Well, thank you very much, everyone, for allowing me to be here today. My name is Tom Pogachnik. I'm the Deputy State Director for Natural Resources, Lands, Planning, and Renewable Energy with the Bureau of Land Management here in California. Uh, Jim Kenna, the State Director of BLM, was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately he got diverted to a less enjoyable task of being in district court this afternoon. So <laughs> while he sits in court, I get the pleasure of being here in Palm Springs with you. So I think I won out on this deal. What I'm going to talk to you about is our renewable energy projects here in California. Um, and really what the focus is, is not the development of the projects, but how we got there. The collaboration it took with the state, local, and other federal agencies in order to make this work. And to go from being a very parochial approach to every agency having its own rules and regulations, to take a more a collaborative approach where we drop down those um, barriers, and how we're able to go forward and get a lot of projects done in a very short period of time. And where we're going with that next, as far as a landscape approach to planning. What I'm going to talk about is touch on three separate subjects here today a little bit. You know, what we're going to look at is policy and, you know, how we came about our renewable energy development, coordination with the state and other interests, as well as how we're going to capitalize on that collaboration, as I mentioned. As director, well, Aaronson, I'm sorry, Aronson mentioned the 2005 Energy Act. That was a major policy for us. That's what got us started in renewables. Since 2010, when we did our first um, right away for renewable energy, we've been driven by these three approaches. First is the, the Renewable Energy Act. Second, a secretarial order that came out in March of 2012 that made renewable energy a priority for the entire department. And third was a, a statement from our director called Smart from the Start. That was Bob Abbey's statement also around March of 2008 or 2009. And what the idea there was, before we started doing these large land scale applications, we were going to work with folks. We were going to work with our partners. We were going to collect up the best science we could. We would make good decisions. Rather than making mistakes and learning, we would do it right, do it smart from the start. Concurrently with what we were, concurrently with us, was also policies going on here in the state of California, and that was primarily Assembly Bill 32, which established the state's renew, renewable, or renewable, okay, renewable policy, portfolio. renewable portfolio standards. Like, You'll have to apologize, I'll have to apologize that I use acronyms and a lot of times I forget what the little letters mean. And so please excuse me on that. But it's become such an ingrained part of what we do that the RPS goals are something that we as a federal agency are even striving to achieve. In addition, as part of the Secretary's order, we established renewable energy coordination offices, and those were comprised of biologists, realty specialists, archaeologists, and other skilled professions throughout the state of California, primarily in two locations, Southern California in the state office in Sacramento. Those folks are primarily focused on renewable energy policy development. And the whole purpose was to expedite delivery and meet that RPS standard of 33%. As part of that, what we did was establish an MOU with the governor's office. And if this occurred in 2008 initially, I'm sorry, I think I skipped past that. Did I jump? Yes, I did. Apologize for that. But we established a memorandum of understanding between the Secretary Salazar and then Governor Schwarzenegger in 2008 to initiate our cooperation collaboration. That was reaffirmed in 2009 with um, Governor Schwarzenegger. And then here recently in 2012 with Governor Brown, the Secretary also signed an MOU. The idea being that while agreeing to cooperate is great, reliving that, making it a living document and continually upgrading it and updating it was important also. The success of the federal and state is dependent on that interagency and intergovernmental cooperation. And the MOUs established two very important groups. First is the Renewable Energy Policy Team, referred to as REPG, so I'll, I'll start slipping into my acronyms again, as well as the Renewable Energy Action Team, the REA Team. 
And the Renewable Energy Policy Team is comprised of the state directors and executive level members of all the federal and state agencies involved with renewable energy planning in the state of California. The Renewable Energy Action Team are senior um, policy specialists, such as myself, also from those same agencies. And what we do is with the senior executives, they work primarily on policy and um, executive decision making, and the staff works on the operations. And what it did is it expanded our partnerships. Um, the 2012, the successes of 2008, 2009, 2010 <coughs> allowed us to, to push to expand the Renewable Energy Policy Group to increase additional participation. And that included um, adding some of the transmission planning groups, as well as folks from the um, Department of Defense. We have representatives from the Marine Corps, Air Force, Army, and Navy who all have bases in Southern California and now are part of the Renewable Energy Policy Group as well as bringing in the Environmental Protection Agency, State Lands Commission, State Parks, California Independent Systems Operators, and a lot of this was brought in to help us with our transmission planning. Uh, initially, we had a very good group that was looking at the, the landscape issues, looking at um, impacts to wildlife, and, but we didn't have a good representation from the transmission. And of course, where you're going to site renewable energy is also very dependent on where you could get transmission into it. Since, since we established the, the Renewable Energy Policy Group in our joint, we've approved 15 solar projects throughout California, at least on public lands in Southern California. That's comprised about 5,700 megawatts that have been approved for construction. Uh, number of jobs. But it, what it's done is also expanded our sharing of resources like GIS technology, our websites, research. We collaboratively work with the California Energy Commission on a joint website that posts all of our information from both all the federal agencies that are partners here so that the public has one-stop shopping when they want to see what the policies are, what the procedures are for renewable energy siting in California. You could go to the Energy Commission's website and find links and all that information posted at one place. And what it did is a lot is to take the energy and the, the effectiveness of one agency and combine it with the multitude of agencies and improve our efficiencies. It also allowed us to jointly align our renewable, our um, environmental assessment process. Um, the BLM required to do follow through the National Environmental Policy Act through an environmental impact statement and California has this California en Environmental Quality Act, CESA. And then the Energy Commission has its own version of CESA. And unfortunately, they're very laborious processes and they could be very cumbersome for the public to read two documents permitting the same project. And what we've done is linked up those projects so that there is one NEPA CEQA document that we issue, and it's reduced the time of permitting as well as improved the efficiency. It's really been a benefit to both the industry as well as to public to have this joint process. What we've done is gone from, and a typical NEPA process has gone from a 24-month permitting uh, to down to a 10 to 12 month permitting process from the start of the notice of intent to our record of decision. And a lot of that has to do with the joint processing, the sharing of resources and the collaboration where it reduces our um, <coughs> comment period and we're able to work on projects jointly, solve issues jointly through the Renewable Energy Policy Group. The Renewable Energy Action Team meets with the developers and the, and the environmental groups to resolve issues. We're able to highlight those issues jointly through all the agencies at once, rather than having folks go from agency to agency if they had to go to Fish and Game for a permit and Fish and Wildlife. Instead, they come to the Renewable Energy Action Team and they could get that input immediately from all the agencies at once. And so what it's done is shorten up the developer's timeline to getting development, getting to a plan of development completed. It's also allowed us to shorten up our NEPA and our environmental review time because a lot of that time was spent in coordination. Now because we do it all the time, it's re reduced. Now one of the other aspects I forgot to mention with the policy group, we get together with the executive every month. 
the first Thursday of every month, and we have been doing that for three years now. The Renewable Energy Action Team gets together every Tuesday, every week. And so we take this very seriously. We get together, we resolve issues as immediately as they pop up, and we're able to get them moved forward. The policy group, as well as the action team, will call in developers and ask them for input. Matter of fact, we hosted our friends from Southern Cal Edison two months ago to talk about transmission planning in Southern Cal. And then this next month, we have some folks from the wind industry concerned about impacts of wind development on condors in the Tehachapi Mountains. And so we'll start to address that as a collective group. In addition to helping the developers and helping the NEPA process, it's also helped with the mitigation. What we've been able to do is working through the various agencies who permit and have mitigation measures, we've been able to collaborate and coordinate our activities so that we're not redundant, we're not asking the developers for three or four times maybe what they would be responsible for, what we refer to as nested mitigation. If the Bureau had a mitigation of one to one and fish and game of two to one, we only do two to one, we share that. And thereby reducing the cost and reducing the impacts. In addition, we set up a fund through the Nas National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's an area where the developers can deposit funds and then through that, the NIFWF organization, we're able to contract out to have acquisitions completed, um, highway fencing done, restoration work, and thereby the developer is not responsible for that. They're able to have contracting done, and the Bureau and the other state agencies pick up part of that workload to assist. And that's also been a great benefit because that allows those funds to go into uh, the NIFWF account, which is a semi-federal organization approved by Congress. They are audited every quarter. And so there's a very transparent holding of the funds, how they're kept, and we could get audits on a regular basis to show where those mitigation dollars are at and how they're being expended. In addition, the BLM, as well as all the other agencies, do lessons learned. We've done two joint ones with all the agencies, and every agency does repeated ones on a regular basis. BLM does this about two times a year. And out of that, we've come up with some additional policies. Um, in 2011, we issued three new policies based on what we learned with the first go-around of renewable projects. One was on the National Environmental Policy Act of how to improve the quality of those documents to make them more effective. Second was on due diligence to ensure that the developers were actually cons were serious about development. When we first started this, we received over 300 applications for wind and solar development. A lot of them were what we refer referred to as prospectors. They didn't have the capability, the technical nor financial means to actually build and maintain a solar or wind facility. They were just looking to hold pieces of property and see if they would go up in value. But through the due diligence process, we were able to weed through that to get to the folks who are interested in actually processing and developing renewable energy in California. The other one was the pre-application screening as part of those large scale of applications that came in there wasn't a whole lot of planning ahead of time, so they put them where they thought was a good place, and a lot of times they were in very bad places environmentally. Areas of the counties didn't want them, areas of the state didn't want them, and areas that the local communities didn't want. And so now we've begun a pre-screening process where we meet with the stakeholders, with the REED agencies, to sit down with the developers, go through the issues they're going to face before they even invest a dollar, so that they know what they're heading for and what the conflicts are gonna be in front of them. It's facilitated, again, the developers so they know what to expect. It's also reduced a lot of folks who maybe shouldn't be in the business. For 2012, we're gonna add another seven projects. We're about halfway through approving these. We approved two rights away just last week. And that's gonna be for another 2,100 megawatts. The total since we began this process is about 10,000 megawatts will be approved here in California as well as we are also approving some wind and geothermal projects. There is a number of transmission projects that are under review, and we consider that part of our renewable energy portfolio. Getting the power from the development to the load center is something very important to us also. Through the experience of all these renewable energy projects, what we've done is decided we need to stay, take a different look rather than project by project. Now we're gonna start looking at a landscape approach to planning. One of the reasons we chose to do this is first, as I mentioned, a lot of these developments were located in areas that weren't best suited. 
but also the co collaboration we've developed, the partnerships between the federal, state, and local governments has allowed us to take on a larger planning process, something that we probably wouldn't have thought of in the future. And there are two planning efforts going on right now. One is a bureau initiative that's covering the Western United States, that's the Solar Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement. And second is um, the California Desert Cal um, Conservation Area um, Amendment, and that's being done through what we refer to as the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. And I'll get into both of those here in a minute. The DRECP is interagency. The primary partners are the BLM, California Energy Commission, the um, Fish and Game, as well as Fish and Wildlife Service. Right now, I have to correct that date. Um, we've shown we're going to have a draft in September. We brought in just in the last 30 days our partners from the Department of Defense, and now we've pushed that target date out to include their lands in our planning process. The military is looking at development on base, both for military purposes and also for export of excess megawatts. And so we're going to work their transmission and environmental impacts into our long-term planning. Uh-oh. I seem to have held my thumb down a little too hard. I'm sorry. Nope, I didn't. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, the DRECP is a large scale. This seems to be out of sync somehow sure what happened there. Uh, the DRECP is a large-scale plan that encompasses the southern part of California, about 25% about of the state. This is about 26 million acres and includes a large component of public, private, and other state lands. When you're looking at that largest scope of project near close by to 25 million people, it requires a lot of consultation. And our stakeholder group includes 45 different organizations, both industry, um, environmental groups, as well as tribal interests, federal and state agencies. And this group gets together, or has been getting together for about the last year or so, about every 45 days or so. And in it, we discuss the the desires, the direction, the goals and objectives. And what the DRECP is a step-down approach. What we have are higher level land use plans and what we're looking at is out of the DRECP will not come permits for land use siting, but what would come in is the take permits for um, the Environment or Endangered Species Act as well as the California Endangered Species Act. It would also identify large landscapes where developers can most likely site where they will less likely run into environmental impacts and be able to be close to transmission and thereby reduce impact, reduce load, and also reduce the, um, the time it takes to get to permitting. Oh, I, several slides seem to have disappeared from here, so I apologize for that. So we're going to do this old school. Um, the solar PIS is another large-scale planning effort the Bureau is doing over the six, our six western states, including Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah. And what we're looking at is large landscapes of property that can be made available for renewable energy development. California is the largest state as far as identifying solar energy zones. One of those in particular is just east of here, Palm Springs, between here and Blythe. It's called the East Riverside Solar Energy Zone. It's about 210,000 acres. The areas, what we're looking at is the landscape approach. We're looking at zoning of both areas that are best for permitting, also areas that are best as avoidance. But then there's also those gray areas that we refer to as variance areas. And those areas would be acceptable to renew, identify renewable energy development if they cannot go into a renewable energy zone. Going into the zones gives them um, additional benefits as far as timeliness of permitting, access to more resources, but it doesn't preclude development elsewhere. The zones were identified in partnership with the state agencies to maximize this, this is only for solar, maximizing the solar energy resource as well as the, minimizing the environmental impacts. And as I mentioned, uh, the rod is scheduled for sometime in November of this year. Oops, a little fast on that little butt. 
But I think one of the messages I really want to leave with you today is, you know, we could develop a lot of things like um, 15 renewable energy projects, 10,000 megawatts, several hundred miles of power transmission lines, um, creating 10,000 jobs. You know, these are quantifiable results of a renewable energy program. But really what the last three years has brought is a different level of collaboration here in California between the state and federal agencies. We work on a daily basis now on renewable energy projects, but that's carried over to other programs, other issues that we have faced and have been long lingering within the agencies. The getting together with the executives every month, we've been able to air problems, not just with renewables, but with such things as with the, the Delta, uh, water, um, sage grouse and other resource issues that are having an impact here in California. So that collaboration has become ingrained as part of the endemic way of which we do business now here in California. And what we've done is we, through these land use planning processes, we've dropped the boundaries, the administrative areas that we protected. On the maps, when you look at them, we don't actually publish what those boundaries are. We don't show what is BLM, what is Forest Service, we just show the landscape. And so what we've been able to do is take a different approach to landscape management, to land use planning, and that's really benefit for renewable energy. And so this has resulted in a benefit to us as public agencies where we're able to improve our efficiency. It's improved the um, industry where they could get to permit faster and cheaper. And it's also improved transparency to the public. And so it's been a tremendous benefit all the way around. And so I apologize for some of the confusion in the slides but I'll be here to try and untangle some of that confusion I may have created during the question and answer period. Thank you very much.